and welcome! Today we are going to look at rapid sequence intubation. This talk is aimed at students who are coming to rotate through our department and also at any new interns or medical officers who are coming into the anesthesia department. But it will also be helpful for anybody that's working in casualty or indeed in any wards where rapid sequence intubation may be a skill that you need. So we're going to use a memory aid called the seven P's of RSI to help us remember the different steps. First of all, though, we need to ask ourselves, why do we need to do RSI? And the answer is that it's mostly for patients with full stomachs. So it's for patients who are at risk for aspiration during the intubation process. So this would be any patient who is not adequately fasted, who's coming for emergency surgery, for example. And the guidelines we look at for fasting is two hours for clear liquids, four hours for milk, six hours for a normal meal and eight hours for a fatty meal. So if patients um, had anything within those time frames, they may be um, at risk for aspiration. It also obviously includes trauma patients because we don't know when last day they had something um, to, to eat or drink and they may not be able to tell you. They also can get a gastroparesis as a result of the traumatic experience. And then patients like diabetics due to autonomic dysregulation can also get gastroparesis so may need to be fasted for a longer, fasted for a longer period, of, period of time. So that's why we do RSI. So now let's look at those seven P's and we're going to focus on each of these individually. But just to just to prepare ourselves, the first P is preparation. The next one is pre-medication, then pre-oxygenation, protection, we'll come to what that means, prompt induction and paralysis, passing the tube with proof and finally planning for further management. So let's look at preparation. And here we're really talking about preparing your equipment, your monitors and your medication that you're going to need. In terms of equipment, it's useful to remember the six metals and six plastics um, mnemonic. And in terms of your six metals, one and two is your laryngoscope handle and laryngoscope blade. Make sure that you have more than one size of laryngoscope blade available. Number three is your introducer. Four is a McGill's forceps in case you need to remove any foreign objects or if you need to pass a nasogastric tube, for example. An artery forceps, which in theater we'll usually use to secure our breathing circuit after intubation. And a pair of scissors. Scissors are always useful. You never know when you need to open a packet of something. Your six plastics going from the outside in is a face mask that will be the appropriate size for your patient, oropharyngeal airways of different sizes, endotracheal tubes of different sizes, a syringe to inflate the cuff of the ET tube, a rigid suction catheter like a Yankawa suction catheter, and of course you must have suction tubing and a suction apparatus, otherwise your Yankawa means nothing. So that's your six metals and your six plastics. In terms of medications, what we need um, is something for pre-medication, then something for induction, and finally something for paralysis. And then also make sure that you have a monitor available that can monitor the patient's pulse, blood pressure and saturation. Also nice if you can have a capnograph or capnometer available to confirm intubation later on. So now we come to pre-medication. And we really want to use our pre-medication to further prevent aspiration or to reduce the effects of aspiration if it does happen. So the first thing that we can give is metoclopramide. Metoclopramide is a prokinetic, but it will also help to increase the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter, therefore reducing the chance of regurgitation. Now, as we said, as a prokinetic, it will help to empty the stomach, therefore reducing the volume of the stomach contents. Other things that we can use is sodium citrate that can be dissolved in water and giving to, given to the patient. 
and an H2 blocker like ranitidine. These two agents work to increase the pH of the stomach content so that if you do aspirate, it is less harmful to the lungs. Now the timing is important with these agents. For sodium citrate, it must be given within 30 minutes of your intubation attempt. So if you give it to the patient and there's any delay, then you will need to repeat the dose if it is uh, more than half an hour since you gave it the first time, or half, more than half an hour um, from when you gave it until an um, intubation. With ranitidine, it's the other way around. Then you actually need to give it um, about 40 minutes before you attempt intubation for it to have a, an effect. Um, but I would probably still, even if I did not have enough time, I would still give ranitidine because it will um, in the longer term reduce your acidity, which can help to reduce the severity of aspiration, uh, maybe at extubation or in case your tube wasn't properly inflated. At least it does give you a bit of protection later on. Please note that we are not giving the patients uh, proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole or pantoprazole because those actually take a couple of days to have a full effect. So either sodium citrate or ranitidine is what you would use in the short period of time. Right. Then we can also use our um, pre-medication agents to reduce the intubation response. And particularly in some patients, we may want to do this. And this would be patients where the sympathetic response to intubation can be harmful to them. So, for example, patients with myocardial infarctions, with dissecting aneurysms, we really don't want them to, um, to, to have a tachycardia and hypertension. Also, patients with reactive airways who can potentially develop bronchospasm or laryngospasm from the intubation response. And then any patients with raised intracranial pressure or intracranial hemorrhage where you do not want to worsen the damage through your intubation response. So what can we give the patients? One option is to give them IV lignocaine at quite a big dose, 1 to 1.5 milligram per kilogram, um, which will help to reduce your intubation response. Um, the other option that you also have is to give fentanyl in a dose of 1 to 2 micrograms per kilogram. Apology, there's a mistake on the slide. It's 1 to 2 micrograms per kilogram. But do be aware that um, that can, especially in elderly patients who are more sensitive, or in patients who may have had some benzodiazepines um, prior to you starting your intubation, um, it may actually reduce your airway um, reflexes and it may um, contribute to the risk for, for aspiration. So just be aware of that. But these would be the two options that you have in those patients if you want to reduce the intubation response. Good. So next we're going to look at pre-oxygenation. And this is really important because unlike during elective intubations where we have time to bag the patient after we've given the, um, the induction agent, usually with rapid sequence intubation, the aim is to not ventilate the patient after you've given your induction and your muscle relaxing agent um, so that you don't run the risk of inflating the stomach. So there's going to be a period of time when your patient is apneic and when you are not ventilating them. So they need enough oxygen in their lungs to sustain them during that period. Otherwise, they are going to become hypoxic quite quickly. So we want to pre-oxygenate the patient in such a way that we can fill the lungs with almost 100% oxygen. So we're washing out all of the nitrogen that was um, in the lungs as well. So how are we going to do this? The first thing is that you need to use a tight-fitting face mask. So a proper seal on the patient's face, 100% oxygen flowing, um, and, this, and, and, the, and the mask must make a nice seal on the face. For how long? So first of all, if you are going to do normal tidal volume breaths. So if the patient maybe can't cooperate um, or if you're just going to let the patient breathe normally before the intubation, normal tidal volume breaths, you need to um, hold the, your tight fitting face mask with 100% oxygen for three minutes. An alternative would be to ask the patient to take full vital capacity breaths, which means a full inspiration, full expiration, 
And if they can do that, then they can give you eight breaths over a minute. And that should also give you adequate pre-oxygenation. If you do have in tidal oxygen monitoring available, then you will know that it's adequate when your in tidal oxygen reading is more than 90%. Then we come to protection. And this is now further protection against aspiration. And this should make you think about doing cricoid pressure. Now, cricoid pressure is not external laryngeal manipulation. External laryngeal manipulation or the burp maneuver is something we do to make us see the vocal cords better during intubation. Cricoid pressure is not that. Cricoid pressure, you are not pressing on the thyroid cartilage, you are pressing on the cricoid ring below the, the thyroid cartilage. Take some time on yourself just to slide the finger down from the thyroid cartilage, from your Adam's apple, slide your finger down until you feel a little indentation on the trachea, and the ring below that little indentation is the cricothyroid, uh, cricothyroid cartilage, or the cricoid um, cartilage. So that is the level where you are going to do cricoid pressure. Now the thing with cricoid pressure is that you must be in the correct location, you must apply adequate pressure, which is um, described as 10 newtons when the patient is still awake. So you actually start this before you do start with your um, induction agent. Um, and once the patient becomes unconscious, you increase that pressure to 30 newtons. Now, how much is that? Um, because 30 newtons means nothing to, to most of us. So basically, what, what they describe is that if you use your thumb and index finger to press down on the cricoid cartilage, you need to press down for your finger enough for your fingertips to go white. Another way that they say that you can kind of um, estimate the pressure is if you press on the bridge of, uh, of your nose, if you press hard enough until it hurts, that is the amount of pressure that you need to apply. So something that you actually need to practice before you go in and do it. The other thing is that only one person should be doing cricoid pressure and that one person does nothing else. So that means that it's a pair of hands that is completely blocked. That person cannot pass you a tube or do anything else for you. They need to concentrate on the cricoid pressure and on doing it correctly. Because the thing is that there are a couple of controversies with cricoid pressure. One is that if you do not give adequate pressure, that you could actually be opening the lower esophageal sphincter, which may actually encourage regurgitation, and the moment you let go cricoid pressure, the patient can then aspirate. That's the one. The other thing is that there's some conflicting evidence about where the esophagus actually goes, because the idea with cricoid pressure is that you compress backwards to close the esophagus. But They've shown in some studies that the esophagus actually moves laterally. But then there are some studies that show that you still do occlude the, the esophagus enough um, to, to protect against aspiration. So it's not something that is practiced everywhere. You need to check in the institution where you are working. Most doctors at our hospital do still do cricoid pressure, but bearing in mind all of the controversies that, that are surrounded with it. The other thing is that you need to be aware of the contraindications. If the patient is actively vomiting, you need to release cricoid pressure, otherwise you can get tears in the esophagus. Also, if the patient has a C-spine fracture, you are probably not going to do cricoid pressure. So be aware of it. It is still practice. It may still give some benefit in terms of protecting against aspiration, but it is not, um, it's not as straightforward as you may, as you may think. And then the reason why we've put it in as protection before actual induction is that you need to start it when the patient is still awake. Um, and then once the patient falls asleep, you increase the pressure. Good. So now we've done all of the preparation bits. Now we actually come to induction and paralysis. And I've made it prompt induction and paralysis. Prompt meaning quick and rapid as well. And you can use any of the induction agents that you have available, depending where you work, and depending on the patient's condition. 
Propofol will probably be the one that you see used most often, but it has the downside of reducing your blood pressure quite significantly. So it may not be ideal in patients who are shocked. Um, in that case, you may want to use Etomidate, which is more cardiovascularly stable. And just make sure that you know the induction dose for the patient because you're actually going to calculate the dose and you're going to give that to the patient fairly rapidly as part of your induction. Once the patient then becomes unconscious from your, from your induction agent, your um, assistant doing cricoid pressure, if you are doing that, will then start to press down quite hard on the cricoid um, cartilage. And as soon as your induction agent has gone in, you then move on to prompt paralysis, where you're going to give the patient a muscle relaxing agent. Now, the one that we most like to use is succimethonium or scoline or SUX for short. That is given in a dose of 1 to 1.5 milligram per kilogram. And the reason why we use succimethonium is because of its quick onset of action. You can have optimal intubation conditions within 45 to 60 minutes, uh, se seconds, 45 to 60 seconds, sorry. So you can intubate really quickly. And the other benefit is that it has a very short duration of action of about four to six minutes. So you can intubate quickly. And if you need the patient to regain their, their own breathing, they will do so within, within five minutes usually. Another alternative would be rocuronium, because as we know, succimethonium is not without side effects. So you can use rocuronium as well, but where the normal intubation dose um, would be 0.6 to 0.9 milligram per kilogram if you're doing an elective intubation where you have time. For rapid sequence intubation, you need to give 1.2 milligrams per kilogram. And that is going to give you optimal intubation conditions within 60 seconds. So maybe a bit longer to start working than succimethonium, but still you can intubate within a minute of giving it. The downside with that, though, is that at that dose, the rocuronium will paralyze your patient for about 75 to 90 minutes. So that's why um, we still use succimethonium because of its short duration of action. But if you have rocuronium available, that is another option as well. Once you've then um, induced your patient and paralyzed your patient, the next thing to do is to pass the tube with proof. So passing the tube means we are intubating, we are placing the, the endotracheal tube below the level of the vocal cords, as we can see in this picture. And we want to make sure that we are in the right place. So we need proof that we are in the right place. And there are four things that we are going to look at. The first one is that you actually see the tube going through the cords. Next, you see chest rise when you, bag, bag venti when you um, ventilate the patient with your bag. Next, when you auscultate, when you do your five-point auscultation, you confirm placement. If you are new to doing intubations or if you are not sure that you saw the tube going through the vocal cords, the first place where you listen is the stomach. And if you hear any gurgles, you immediately remove your tube, start bag mask, ventilating the patient again to um, get their saturations up, and then you try the intubation again. If you're sure that there are no bubbles and gurgles over the stomach, then you can listen over your, um, your apices and then um, down in the axillae um, as well. And that's more to confirm the depth of your tube, that it hasn't gone too deep. And finally, once you've done your, your five or six breaths, then you can look at your capnograph if you have one, or a capnometer if you have that available. Um, and that will then be your definitive confirmation that you are in. Okay, so that's the proof we need. And finally, once we've now done that, we need to plan for further management. So we need to know, are we going to keep this patient sedated? Are we going to put the patient on a ventilator? Or do we actually want him to start breathing spontaneously that will put him onto a T-piece? If he's going to be on a ventilator, do we need to further paralyze this patient? 
is the patient going to be admitted? Where are they going? Are they going to ICU? Are they going to high care? So these are the things you need to start planning now. And then um, that's it really. So if you want any further information, have a look at, at these references. Um, Life in the Fast Lane is always very nice for a quick reference. Um, the rest of the information is mostly from, from up to date. Um, and that's it. So the seven P's of rapid sequence intubation. I hope that you will remember these steps and that RSI will be quick and easy for you in the future. Thank you and bye-bye.